Hi, welcome to Women's Health Podcast. And today I am joined by Lizzie Harrison. I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell us all about what she does. But in the meantime, if you ever need any help with any women's health issues, menopause, fertility, or if you're even just having trouble with your cycle, there's a link below in the bio and just give it a click and that will, um, you know, book an appointment with me. Or you can contact me directly and I'll leave all that information in the chat box at the bottom. Okay, welcome to the podcast, Lizzie. I am so delighted that you're here. Thank you. And um, I, I just want to say as well, before we start, that Lizzie has done the most amazing job with my daughter, Hannah. She filled her with confidence that I can't even tell you that she was able to really move forward with her life and grow into the beautiful person that she's growing into or she is mm -hmm. and that was all thanks to your help it was amazing the work oh, that you did with her. Thank you very much well I will reciprocate that <laughs> by saying I have been going to Lucy for acupuncture uh advice and nurturing and the most wonderful dietary and lifestyle advice in recent years when I'm struggling so much with menopause and menopause mushy brain um so I would highly recommend you as well for any women's issues uh, to you. all the women out there yeah thank you yeah. thank you highly recommended that's great thanks Good. so much yeah so tell us what you do um and how you help people Okay, Ooh. Uh, what I do, I do a lot of things. And um, I think in the last few years, I've been a little bit hung up on, ooh, you know, how people say you should really define what you do and you should get a niche and I just don't fit into a niche. Uh, I originally trained as a religion teacher, which I loved. I love teenagers. I've always loved teenagers. Um, but I struggled a lot with the whole discipline thing because I think for me I see a person sitting in front of me uh, and it's very hard for me to see education as pouring information into a young person so they pass an exam for me it's all about seeing the potential in a young person and allowing that to come out you know I mean it wasn't hard for me to look at your daughter and see all the wonderful Oh, she blew me away with all the wonderful potential she has and continues to have. And and she did the work. You know, it's always them that uh, will fulfill their own potential. And I suppose sometimes as parents, we're kind of going, oh, come on, I want your direction this way. But the, when they're ready, they will uh, they will rise to the occasion and, uh, oh, my God, blossom, you know. Um, so what do I do? Uh, I trained, as I said, I trained as a religion teacher. And then I went into chaplaincy, which was a lot more holistic and wonderful. So I would have had the wonderful job of counselling kids, uh, arranging, they used to call me the fun teacher, arranging events, uh, doing the liturgies and the masses. I'm very much, I'm a creative person. So it's all about symbolism and using music uh, to um, express your emotion um I I am involved in religion but I'm very much someone who is a spiritual person and I'm open to all types and creeds of spirituality but my spirituality is grounded in in my Catholic tradition um but I'm open to all and um sometimes I suppose the comment I've got from from young people around religion is you know how is it you're smiling so much and for me it's all about joy god is all about joy and god is love and whatever way that comes to you that's that's where i'm focused from and um, so in recent years then my two children were diagnosed with autism so i suppose i had to step back a little bit and i had moved from dublin down to esker monastery to work there in youth ministry and did wonderful work with teenagers there um, but I just couldn't give that commitment of full time. So I trained as a life coach and suddenly discovered, oh, my God, I have a lot to work on myself. Uh, I think after 40 years, I finally heard the self-belief uh, that I had been carrying through all through school, all through college. You're stupid. I'm stupid. And I kind of suddenly went, that's not true. <laughs> How could I do all this all the way through school and college if I was stupid? Um, so for me, doing life coaching had more of an impact on me than any person I've helped since. 
And I suppose it gave me that realization we're all carrying these negative self beliefs that are holding us back. And if I could just get in touch with young people and and help them to realize it's only a thought and a thought can be changed and they're not the only one. And, you know, change that self-belief and look at that self-belief and challenge it um, and and get them in touch with their inner potential again. Um, look at the amazing opportunities that would arise for them. Um, so I also in the last few years, I struggled with my health. I had a kidney transplant 20 years ago yesterday. Uh, so I had my kidney versary. Uh, Sydney is down here. Uh, I've one at, one at the front and two at the back that don't work anymore. Um, and for me, probably losing my health was the best thing that ever happened to me because for the first time in my life, I had to look after myself. And I always said before that, you know, if anything happens to me, it'll be okay, but please don't let anything happen to my friends or my family. But suddenly I lost my health and I had to look after myself and I had to challenge the, the negative thoughts I had been telling myself. I had to be able to look in the mirror and instead of hating myself, start to love myself again and nurture and take care of myself. So um, I over the years, I have had mental health challenges and have gone to counselling and it's been very transformative and very helpful. Um, but then I suppose the life coaching was another layer of that because it's based on positive psychology. So instead of dwelling on the past, um, you're looking to the future and setting goals and challenging negative beliefs. And it's very proactive and it's very positive. Um, and the other huge transformational um, element in my life has been mindfulness. And um, so I suppose what mindfulness has given me is, first of all, awareness that I have some of these beliefs and I have some of these feelings and maybe the effects they've had on my on my body and on my thoughts and on my actions. And then self-compassion um, would be another element that I'm very passionate about, where you tell yourself, you know, I. OK, things are bad. I feel bad at the moment it's okay to feel bad. Anyone would feel bad in this particular situation. And it's okay, darling, you know. Um, whereas in the past, it would have been you stupid idiot. What did you say that for? It's this negative voice that's constantly in our heads criticizing us. Uh, I think what mindfulness has done for me is it's given me uh, nearly like, you know, that little angel sitting on your shoulder that can say, hold on now, Lizzie, what are you saying to yourself there? I don't think that's true. Um, instead of in the past, I would have been in it and believe in it. And I think for a lot of teenagers, that is the case. They they look in the mirror, all they see is ugly or fat, or, you know, they, they have such negative um, talk to themselves. And, uh, you know, for me, it was that transformation of, of, of being able to look in the mirror and actually love what I see and, you know, kind of say, God, you're looking good today, Lizzie. You know, changing that tape, um, it took it took the, the, the bad times, it took the mindfulness, it took the counselling, it took everything to shift that, but it has shifted. And I'm very, very blessed. And I suppose as a life coach, what I want to do, I am passionate about teenagers. What I want to do is help them to shift that too and just open up that potential, that wonderful life that's there. Um, today, the Leave and Search results came out. I mean, whoever decided that you could be defined by a set of numbers on a page, you know, um, I didn't know when I was 18 that I would end up as a life coach or a mindfulness teacher or a singer, actually, in recent times. Um, and life just unfolds like that. As long as you keep following what you love, what you enjoy, what brings you joy, life will unfold and it'll bring it all to you. Um, yeah. So... Have I have I answered that question? What do yeah, I do? Yeah, loads of questions. <laughs> There's lots of questions to ask you back now. Good, good, good. Lots, yeah. lots of questions. So, yeah. um, 
You know, I think going right back to the beginning, you were saying as parents, we mm. want the best for our children, yeah. but sometimes we think that they should go down a path mm. and that they actually really, you know, the path that, you know, say like be a medical doctor, say, yeah. but yeah, actually yeah. they want to be a mechanic, completely something completely yeah. different. Like, mm. um, how do you, what, what advice would you give a parent who is struggling with that teenager, who's maybe got their leaving research, results today and they've enough points to do doc mm -hmm. become a doctor but actually they're going no, I'm going for apprenticeship to do be a mechanic you know and that's because mm -hmm. it can be devastating for parents when you're mm -hmm. when your children don't do what you expect them to do <laughs> yeah 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 um I suppose like do did we do what our parents expected us to do um I remember being very um being very proud of myself because my 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 parents were very proud I was becoming a teacher. Like when you were in secondary school, it was like you become a teacher, you become a nurse, you become a doctor. You know, there was like set defined roles of what you become. Um and I suppose I slid into that because that's what I thought was expected of me that's what I thought I'd be good at and this this is the only way I can fulfill my love of faith my love of young people my love of music as well you know as a teacher you get so many opportunities to to be creative um I didn't see any other options and nobody sees other options and the, the jobs that exist today didn't exist 10 years ago like whoever knew you could become a millionaire from putting videos up on YouTube you know um, and and 10 years time, the jobs that will exist then don't exist now. And it is those young people that are creating those jobs. You know, um, the world is is changing. Like even to give you an example. Um, yeah, I, I suppose for me, I trained as a religion teacher, so I should be a teacher and I should have a permanent pensionable job and uh, be ready for my retirement over COVID. I started singing online and getting paid for it. I've never been paid for singing. I always loved singing. I've always been a singer. I worked, sang for the, um, what do you call it, Carers Association. I sang for the Wheelchair Association. Um, like who knew you could get paid by being online? Um, I coached two people in England. Like, it's amazing, like the opportunities that are starting to become available. But I think when you have fear in your mind, it blocks creativity, you know. And even if you think of the brain itself, you know, this part of the brain, the prefrontal cor cortex, I'm really interested in neuroscience and uh, I'm really trying to use that. I use that with teenagers all the time because they get science. It's tangible and, and they so the little tricks and tips that I give them that help them. So if you if you see your fist as the model of the brain, this part of your brain is the prefrontal cortex. And that's the part of your brain that's to do with creativity and reasoning and planning and learning. Um, and then something happens, an event happens or you experience fear. Fear is such a trigger for, for this and your brain flips and suddenly you don't have access to that part of your brain at all and even teenagers they don't fully dis, um, develop this part of the brain until they're 25 um, but then when this flips the, you, you're, you're into the emotional brain you're into the, uh, the brain where um, your, your fear and your fight or flight um, I'm sure people understand that it's explained to death this part of the brain but basically you don't have access to this anymore so while the parents are afraid for your child you as a parent, you don't have access. You don't have access to this. And you're not seeing the wonderful, beautiful child that's in front of you. And children become what you expect them to become. Um, and and uh, if you see the potential and trust them and see the things that they can do, um, it's amazing what they can do. Like even Daniel, my, my son is, is autistic and... Oh my God, he teaches me every day. He's he, he's fearless. He he doesn't care what anyone thinks of him. He brought me uh, busking during the summer and suddenly I'm earning money through busking, you know. Um, I was terrified. I was shaken. I, I could actually feel my heart in my neck pounding uh, with fear. 
Daniel, no fear at all. So just get out there, busk, rap. You should see the teenagers passing him and the admiration that that that, that they look at him with. Um, fear is so destructive, whether it's your fear for your child or the child's fear or your fear for yourself. It's it's trust and it's faith. And you don't have to have faith in, in a God or go to mass on a Sunday. It's faith in yourself and faith in your child that it will unfold, it will happen. Um, and, and really, it's when you start to, to get fearful that then the bad decisions are, are made and, and people get stuck in jobs that they hate. Um, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And <laughs> I love that. I still, hopefully, hopefully I never will. It'll be great. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I just, this is a bit of a side now, but um, my son has gone to Canada yeah. He's gone for two years and we went out for dinner, myself, my best friend, PJ and his sister. And we had five of us. We did a really fabulous night. It was mm-hmm. really good fun. And um, I sat there and I said, when I grow up, because uh, I don't consider myself a grown up no. at all. And no. he goes, but mom, you're a grown up. You have to be a grown up. And yeah. I was like, but where is that written down? Where is it written yeah. that yeah. I have to be a grown up? Yeah. And yeah. he was like. He was kind of like yeah. shock horror. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I, it, you know, it, yeah. I still like having fun. I still like going dancing. Yeah. I still yeah. like meeting up with my friends and laughing yeah. my head off. Oh, Just because sure. I'm in my 50s does not mean I can't do sure. those things. Oh, for sure. Like, yeah. Okay. Fair enough, mum. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like, it, it says, oh, to, to grow is to, to grow is to change and to live is to change often. I think that's the quote. It's kind of this thing change is good change is 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 life-given and and um you know who knows what potential like in the last uh as I said I bring this up now in the last month <laughs> uh even less my life has changed completely and for the better I um am a life coach and I do singing and, and all of that is fine but it wasn't really um enough to keep me going my my two children are autistic and I kind of have to be available them to uh, do appointments but I'm a social person and I miss people so suddenly now on my doorstep there are 150 Ukrainians in the monastery in Esker and I've got involved there with a group called Curve and it's run by um a, a group of volunteers locally uh, some politicians, Kieran Cannon has been fantastic, Declan Kelly has been fantastic, uh, run by, um, there's somebody on the uh, Redemptorist Committee and then the Ukrainians themselves. And the amount of wonderful things we've been able to do as a group in the last two weeks has been amazing. Like we've clothed 31 children to go off to, to school uh, the people are magic and and I, I I go over there now and I, I've made friends you know these women in their early 40s over here with the, they had to leave their husbands probably their mothers I'm afraid to ask them where they come from or or, or what has happened to them because it's too triggering for them it's too raw they're they're all very traumatized but they're so grateful and they're so kind and they're so funny and uh, I, I've actually made friends. Like, who knew that was going to happen? That's come out of nowhere. But it's like suddenly everything I've ever learned and all the people I've ever gotten to know, I'm able to connect it all and and bring it together with with bring these skills together to help these people. So you don't know what potential your child has. You don't know what they might be able to come up or what the world brings to them but as long as they keep following their heart as long as they're joyful and keep following their joy then they're they're on the right path you know um yeah who knows what what, what the world is going to bring you know yeah I'm going to bring you back to your own children your yeah. two boys yeah how when you and, and I know this because I I well, I know you from coming yeah. to my clinic but yeah. I also know I have other women that I do know who have children who are autistic or maybe Mm -hmm. someone on this podcast whose child could be possibly being diagnosed Mm -hmm. with autism um like how did you cope with this was it a shock was it anger were you very upset were you mad at yourself and there's a billion questions there sorry to answer yeah 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 but you know how 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 did you cope yourself and your husband 
Yeah, I, I suppose just a bit of a backstory to that. I had a kidney transplant when I was uh, 20. Uh, oh, God, when did I have it? When I was 30 uh, and I, I got married. I never knew I'd meet somebody. I was sick for five years. I never knew I'd get married. I never knew I'd have children. So when my children came along, it was such joy and, and such elation. Oh, my God, I never thought this would happen. And then they were diagnosed. It was like... Hold on now. The child I thought I had is not the child I have. So I grieved. I, I, I think I think whenever you experience a loss, people forget that. I grieved when I lost my health. I grieved when I was told my children had autism. Because whenever something happens to you, that it's a loss of something that you expected to be different, you're going to grieve. And that's OK. Um, so, um that, that's the first part of it. But now I have two children with autism. They teach me so much. Oh, my God. There, there's a theory that people with autism have come into this world to change it. Because let's face it, it's a bit messed up. Like Daniel is, is nearly 16. He cannot see uh, ch different, like uh, why difference in people should make a difference. He can't understand racism. He can't understand the war in Ukraine. He can't understand someone being mean to someone else. He is so honest. Now, honest to a, a little bit of a, it can be a little bit hurtful sometimes, but so honest. And then I'm kind of thinking, and sometimes we say, oh, no, I can't say that, Daniel. And I'm thinking, well, why can't he? You know, um, you know, I think they have the most beautiful qualities to bring to the world. And I feel like standing up and shouting from a rooftop, do you realize what has come into the world and what gifts they can bring? Um, now, you could say for, for someone who, whose child is severely autistic and, and they're nonverbal and all the rest, that's really hard. But those children still have amazing gifts to bring. Um, and they are still here for a reason. And, and as parents, again, it's probably a little bit, maybe a little bit more challenging to, to see the potential that they have and, and allow that potential to unfold. Now, Daniel is not interested in study. He's not interested in academics, but he wants to be a film director. He knows every single thing about camera angles, cinematography and Every movie, every director, uh, every genre movie, he knows everything there is to know because he is, he had, when people have autism, they usually have a special interest. And we need people who are specialized in certain things. You know, we go through our whole education system where it's so broad and people only specialize at the very top, at the PhD level. People with autism specialize down here. Can you imagine how much more they're going to know by the time they get to PhD level if they are given the opportunities and if we are aware of them and, and the, the wonderful gifts that they can bring? Um, I suppose for, for a mother of young children, it was difficult because people don't understand and they do judge. And it's very, very difficult to be a mother and to be judged. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I was at uh, I was at mass one day with them and they had just seen SpongeBob SquarePants, the movie. Mm -hmm. And in SpongeBob SquarePants, your man takes off his hat and he's bald, right? And his, his head is shining. And in the movie, it goes bald, bald, bald. My eyes, you know? So anyway, I was at mass. It was in the cathedral in Ballina, very kind of prim and proper. And there was a lot of old people in the bench and the place was full. So I was kind of getting in beside the old people. So I said, excuse me, excuse me, can I get past you? Can I get past you? And we got into the, the seats. So I said, phew, we got here. OK, I looked down and the two of them were wearing different shoes. I thought, oh, geez, OK, I can't do anything about that. I forget it. So I sat there and the next thing they were laughing and messing. And the next thing, Daniel just pointed at the bald man in front of him. And I just went, no, no, no. And he said, bald, 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 my eyes. I went, oh, my God. Like, they would hang you, and as all children would. But but children with autism particularly, they're just so honest. And um, 
you know, honesty is not a bad thing in this world. If we had a little bit more honesty, it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Hope I've answered that question. Haven't no, I? I think you have. And it's actually yeah. interesting you saying that um, when Amber is uh, one of her best friends is Priya. Yeah. And Priya, they were chatting on the phone, as they normally yeah. do on yeah, FaceTime. Yeah. Mm. And Priya had to go. But her, she, she didn't say goodbye to Amber. She just hung up the phone. Yeah. And then so Amber rung her back and later on in the day, and it's quite funny because I would say to Paula, if you see like a hundred missed calls, it's Amber trying you, not me. So she yeah, knows yeah, it's yeah, yeah, funny. Yeah, she's trying to yeah. be for it. So, um, because they don't have their own mobile phones yet, thank goodness. Mm. But mm. um, then Priya was talking to her again and then she hung up again really quickly. Mm. But then Amber got really annoyed and she left mm. a voice message saying, Priya, I don't like the way you hung up on me. It's not very nice. And it's, you know, we're meant to be friends. Mm. So Paula, I was chatting to Paula and she said, did you hear the message that Amber left Priya? And I said, no, I hadn't listened to it. So I listened to the message and I, my first thing was like, oh my gosh, she shouldn't say those things. Mm. She shouldn't say those things. I'm going to have to talk to her, right? Mm. And then... I thought about it and I was like actually do you know what good for her saying what she thought she just didn't like that Priya hung up on her so I left it to them and the next thing Priya left a message for Amber going sorry Amber my dad does that all the time he just hangs up the phone never says goodbye we were just we were going in swimming and I hung up the phone because I had to go and then mom needed the phone the next time and I hung up the phone so I'll, next time I'll say goodbye to you but wasn't it better I, and I and I know they're only little girls, yeah. nine and ten. Yeah. But before I would have been taught to, you know, say nothing, yeah. keep it, yeah. keep yeah. submissive. Yeah. And I was like, no. If no. I teach my daughter this at ten mm. years old, I'm teaching her a, not the best thing for her. I didn't think. Mm. But it took a lot of me kind of going. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Keep my mouth closed. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. I want yeah. her, you know. Mm to you know get on well in life and stuff mm -hmm. but like mm -hmm. you said let them mm -hmm. find their own yeah, yeah. Way. and it's but, amazing you know how how many um oh i don't know we, we, we've suppressed nearly our our emotions or we've suppressed our our thoughts and our opinions and you can't have opinions in certain situations like i brought daniel for an appointment with the specialist in uh, Temple Street, they both have epilepsy as well. As I say, it's 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 a complicated, <laughs> complicated house. That's why I I um, am at home with the most of the time. But um, it, the specialist was an hour late getting into the room. You know, so you can imagine trying to contain two children with autism um, in the room for an hour. I, by the time she came, I was sweating and I was like, oh my god, is she ever going to come? So anyway, she walked into the room and she was talking to me. And she was talking to Dan and she looked at Dan and very nice of her and she said, um, "Have you any questions?" And Dan said, "Where were you until now?" <laughs> And I just went, oh, my God, I can't believe he said that to the doctor, to the specialist. You know, she was mortified. And then I thought, actually, do you know what? That wasn't a bad thing. Why did she keep two children with autism waiting for an hour? It wasn't fair, you know. And did she answer the question? She was stunned. She was just <laughs> stunned. She, she, she said, uh, oh, I, I had another patient, you know. So, yeah, yeah. I, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a more genuine and authentic world and, you know, and, and maybe maybe they could bring that to the world? <laughs> yeah, possibly, possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you were going along, you were mentioning about dealing with mental health. So yeah, what yeah. did you do to help yourself through this? I know you mentioned yeah. counselling, but mindfulness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have always found counselling good. Um, and it, it kind of gets to to a certain level. But in the end of the day, we are the only people that live in our own heads. So until we become aware of the thoughts we're thinking, the feelings we're having, you know, even the physical feelings we're having, like one thing I discovered through mindfulness, when I'm stressed, I push my tongue at the back of my teeth. So when I'm stressed, I get sore teeth. But I never twigged that sore teeth means I'm stressed, you know. It, it, these are the things you learn through mindfulness, but you only learn through practice. Uh, you, you you can't kind of meditate for five minutes one day a week and expect to learn these things. It's something you need to just, you know, practice, you know, once or twice a day. It doesn't have to be long periods. 
and it just really helps you to get in touch with you and what's going on in your head what's going on in your heart what's going on in your body um just just to ground you and like I was saying it's it nearly create it's, it's created this little friend on my shoulder that says so what's really going on there Lizzie you know so so now for example if I don't know somebody said something to annoy me instead of reacting I might go off and even sometimes I've laid on the bed and kind of gone what's really going on at the moment what am I really thinking what am I feeling where am I feeling that in my body and actually sometimes it's kind of going ah that's why it's upset me whereas at the time if I had reacted out of anger it wouldn't have I wouldn't have discovered what was really going on um don't know not an easy thing to do sometimes no, you know when you no, want to be no no not and, that, and the reason is this lovely little reaction you know we have this prefrontal cortex here but when we experience fear or trauma like the poor uh, refugees in, in in ukraine or something goes wrong there is no time delay there's literally a split second where you fight or flight your brain flips and you don't have access to um you know reasoning and creativity and um this calm down center um but what mindfulness do does is it sometimes it prevents it happening it prevents the the brain flipping sometimes it helps you to realize oh it's oh i'm flipped and bring you down again so if you are flipped and you realize you're flipped you know sometimes you go okay i, I need to walk out of this room quick or i'm, I'm going to blow um you you learn techniques to put the lid back on so simple techniques you you focus on what you can see hear feel um smell or taste uh like this is this is the kind of things i teach to teenagers i don't teach the whole you have to sit for 20 minutes like um mm, um i teach them quick and easy techniques that if their brain is flipped they can learn to put it back on um you focus on your breath um for some people that can be very triggering if you're traumatized or you're an anxious person and you breathe fast a lot of time you, you shouldn't breathe focusing on your breath is the worst thing in the world to do for some people and um, so it's about finding what works for you for some lads i often say to lads young teenage lads get a hurley and get out there and hit the ball against the wall that's mindfulness you know as long as when you're hitting the hurley the ball against the wall you're feeling the hurley in your hands you're hearing the sound of the ball hitting off the wall you're feeling the 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 thing so you're bringing yourself out of your head and into your body so to to get this lid back on your brain again and get your prefrontal cortex working again you focus on your breath or you focus on your senses so what you see here feel taste and touch it was revolutionary for me and for me i think if i hadn't learned mindfulness when i did i probably would have had a lot more uh episodes of of depression or, or, or mental uh bad health um i think it prevented me falling back again um and then the self-compassion side of things was the next element where I started to talk to myself like I would to my own best friend. So now at night time, I, I'd often put my arms around myself and say, God, you did well today, fair play to you. Um, now, it's all not plain sailing, uh, Lucy. I thought I would never be touched again. I thought I was the Buddha, because <laughs> here I was, I knew mindfulness, I knew self-compassion. And I knew um, my life coaching and every everything had brought me a step further, I thought. And then my mother died. And I was rock bottom again, you know. Um, Sending my heart. Yeah, like grief. You know, grief is, is a different thing altogether. You know, like there's been losses, loss of my health, loss, uh, loss of what I thought my children were going to be but then the loss of my mother she was my best friend so that was really tough yeah but I'm I'm nearly 12 months on and um, 
I can feel her in me. I think I have become her actually. Um, and it was through prayer really and through I wasn't able to meditate. There was a few months there where I really wasn't. And I went to my teacher. Louise Shanahar is my teacher. She teaches meditation to, to train meditation to children. So that's where I get my qualification. But she said, Lizzie, don't meditate. You're not able. And, and I thought that was the most, she said, sometimes the most compassionate thing is not to meditate. So I I slept a lot. I took to the bed some days. Um I I didn't eat very well at times, but you know what, looking back on it now, I kind of said I didn't give out to myself too much, and I think that's important. You know, what you can do, you can do, and just let yourself take it a tiny step at a time. It won't always be this bad, you know. Uh, so, yeah, now I feel, and, and actually... What I have done in the last few months is I created a CD. I'm really plugging myself today, I'm telling you. Yeah, no, you're I've, right. I've uh, created a CD of hymns in honour of my mother. I have been singing on a choir since I was four. And I remember sitting on the choir in Arda, where, where I'm from, in Arda Parish in Mayo. And she'd have her arm around me. And she'd be saying, no, we're God's house now. And this is what happens here. And you see, to me, religion was never, you know, about the priest in the long garment. And you do that and you do this. It was about love. It was the Gospels to me are about love and about justice. You know, the the um, the gospel on Sunday was all about humility, you know, um, if you for me the sign of of a religion that is in trouble is a sign that of a, is a religion that's very judgmental um or or very black and white you know that doesn't that doesn't include compassion it, it has to be about love it has to be about compassion it has to be about justice and about service and the poorest of the poor that is where god is you know if you ever get the privilege, which I am again, when I was in Dublin, I was a chaplain in Crumlin and I had the privilege of working with the poorest of the poor. And once again, I'm back working with the poorest of the poor. And I don't mean they're, they're materially poor. These people were professional people in the Ukraine, but they've lost everything, you know. And when you've lost everything, what else is there only love? So that's where God is, you know. Um, and... Uh, it's a, such a privilege to be in that place with those people and just holding that space for them where they know that they're loved. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I go off on a lot of tangents, don't I? <laughs> no, you haven't. You've been an amazing guest. And yeah. like, I think the insight that you gave us with the, the brain flipping, yeah. Yeah. I think that's such a powerful yeah. analogy for yeah. like, and, and it's 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 very mm. powerful because that's it is. what happens. Yeah. You flip and it you is. see red and you don't see yeah. Yeah. you're not listening to what no. anyone else no. is saying. You're just you actually can't what. listen. Yeah. No. There's there's a beautiful uh guy in a 16-year-old in um what do you call it in Esker at the moment, uh, Misha. And I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning his name. I get him to listen to this. He's cool, I love him. Uh but he he's very good English, but I can see when he gets tired, he he, he doesn't have very good English. Like down to the other day, we, we I brought I brought them in to get their uniforms, you know, with such a laugh in the car, and we pulled into Supermax to get a burger, you know, and uh, he was trying to find English. He just I said, Misha, stop! I said, your brain is flipped. You're hungry. So hungry, angry, uh, lonely, or tired. Halt. In, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they have the word halt. If you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, you can't think. No, you can't. You can't. So I said, forget about it. You're trying to speak English, a language you do, you, that isn't, you know, that's alien to you. Get a burger into you. And you should have hear him as soon as he got the burger into it. Like, <laughs> in English. And I said, now, now, you know, when you're tired or when you're hungry, forget about it. You know, just be nice to yourself and you'll get it again. It's such you know. a really great advice, because in Chinese yeah. medicine, they say you can't make healthy decisions when you No healthy decisions can be made by unhealthy people. So as yeah. you said, if you're angry, hungry, tired, yeah. frustrated, any of those things, you can't make 
you can't. And you know that lonely piece, people yeah. forget about it. I, when I was in Dublin, I volunteered on Teen Line. It's like ch- ch- um, Child Line for teenagers. And they're, I, you know, you expect, what's the biggest problem teenagers have? Oh, you know, it's bullying. and whatever. Their top problem all the time, loneliness. Yeah, it, it's shocking. So many teenagers are lonely, you know, because they, they can't be themselves. You know, and they think everyone else has it sorted. We do too, but much more so as a teenager. They don't realise everybody has this negative critical voice. Um, they and 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 they think they're the only ones. Um, and and they they ha- they might even have a group of friends, but are they actually able to really talk to them? You know, so many lads I've talked to, I can't talk to anybody. You know, um. It's amazing, really. And and as parents, we need to create space where they can talk to us. And the best thing for teenagers is sideways talking. Bring them off yes. for uh, bring them off for a drive. I Do agree. a bit of gardening with them. Anything where they're not face to face. If you sit down in front of a teenager and say, Yeah, all right, Jen, what's wrong with you? They'll freak. So <laughs> as an adult, you're freak. Yeah, yeah. What's wrong with you? Nothing. Go away. Yeah. You know, I know. But you, you bring them for the a emotion. walk, you know. Yeah. And like a young lad lately I was coaching, he said, um, big lad, like he said, I love going for walks with my parents and my sister. Wow, that's fabulous. You know, and we forget they actually still love doing that, even when they're 17, 18, even if you have to drag them out to the car. They'll come back laughing and smiling, you know. Absolutely, yeah, um, I know. It's true. Create, it's true. create spaces where they, like we created this thing during um, co- uh, during COVID, uh, what you call it, um, um, a kind of a celebrate me day kind of thing, you know. So we have, uh, we had a Dermot day and let's have a Dermot day. And Dermot then in the beginning of the day would have to say th- three things that he wanted us to do for him that day. And, uh, you know, and, and we'd, we'd say, oh, yeah, sorry. It's a you're a great day. So as soon as Dermot arrived down in the morning, Dermot, you're great. <laughs> and he had to pick what he wanted to do for the day. And just a day where you focus on him. Um, that was fantastic. And like they're still asking, can I have a Dermot day? Can I have a Daniel day? And I'm like, well, can I have a mammy day? <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? You should have yeah, a mammy day. I do. I do have mammy days. And, and I suppose... They, you you think by taking them at the mammy day that you are doing them a favor and that you're looking after them all the time, isn't that great? But the benefit they get from you taking the mammy day is huge. huge. You know, you come back refreshed, you come back full of energy, full of life, and you can actually give again. You know, you can't, I know it's, ridiculously overstated you can't fill from an empty cup but you can't you know um and then look at i i've had i've had uh a few new years now where it was very hard to get to get a babysitter it's very hard to get time for yourself and i understand that especially single mothers i don't know how single parents i don't know how they do it um but just if you can at all get time for yourself and spend time for yourself it will flow back to them in so many. And then it teaches them that it's important for them to do it. You know, yeah. I found with the girls in, in Crumlin, so many of them became their mothers and, 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 and became their mothers were these wonderful, powerful, strong, sac- self-sacrificing women. And then their daughters became these wonderful, strong, self-sacrificing women. But like, where was where was the the self-care then that enabled them to to grow and develop and and uh progress you know that uh yeah it's it's not giving them good example to 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 be martyrs all the time because then they they'll do it too and they'll sacrifice their dreams and their lives for their children and uh it'll the cycle will continue you know um show them how to look after themselves by looking after yourself you know, uh, it's really important. <laughs> I have all this sorted. I know exactly how to do this. I never get wrong, do I? 
<laughs> Lizzie, that is the, the yeah. best advice. It is. It's about yeah. putting your own oxygen mask on first. Yeah. And it's kind of surprising how many yeah. people don't do that. Men and yeah. women. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But look, at, I'm my own worst enemy. And again, a sign a sign of a bad religion is judgment and and i i can't judge i i'm i can be plenty self self sacrificing myself but i know it's not healthy you know it's it's not good for you it's not good for your children you know um you need to because you you get filled with resentment you know look at me they, did, they don't even notice i did the dishes they don't even notice i did the dinner you know and they actually they don't really, but they'd notice if you left and you left it all to them. <laughs> sure would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lizzie, yeah. I just want to say thank you for being the most amazing guest and being so oh. honest and open, uh, you. you know, and about what you do and yeah. coping with life and life yeah. skills because yeah. it's you know it, it is true to life and being yeah. very emotional yeah. about your mom um, yeah. because that would help yeah. so many people. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't, I'm not a toxic positivity coach. Life can be, am I allowed to curse? Life can be yes. bad. Yeah, <laughs> life can be shit. Shit happens. Shit happens. But happens. reach out. There is help. There is people. You know, everyone's at a different stage. Um, there is things you can do. And, and I think the most important thing you can do is become passionate to yourself you know treat yourself like you would your own best friend you know the things we say to ourselves sometimes would we would we say it to a dog you know we need to treat ourselves uh with so much compassion and then we will grow we'll get through it they say it takes 40 seconds for an emotion to pass through your body but if you keep pushing it away it's never going to actually go away whereas if you just say i'm actually quite angry right now <laughs> And allow it and let it be there. There's no such thing as a bad feeling. Um, and in, in Buddhism, they have this thing, two arrows of, of, of suffering. You know, you, you feel bad and then you feel guilty because you feel bad. You know, just feel bad. It's OK to feel bad. Um, and then, you know, the good will come. The bad comes and the good comes. And we're somewhere here in the middle. And life is tough, but... There are a lot of good people out there. There are a lot of positive things and to try and, and bring yourself more towards the positive, you know, um, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a really, no, it's brilliant. I like that, yeah. the two arrows, guilt yeah. and then, uh, I know. feel bad yeah. and then guilt. That's yeah. so true, that's so feel guilt, true. I feel guilty, I feel bad. <laughs> yeah, so true. <laughs> yeah, and it layers, so you know. if yeah. anyone wants to get uh, in contact with you, how can mm -hmm. they do that? Um, so I have an email address, lizzylifecoach at gmail.com. And uh, that's probably the best way, really. Uh, I have a mobile, but I probably won't. Yeah, give me, get, send me an email, lizzylifecoach. Yeah. Now it's L-I-Z-Z-I-E uh, okay. and uh, lifecoach at gmail.com. And yeah, I, I do stuff with one-to-one -one with teenagers. I do mindfulness. I go into schools, secondary schools particularly, because I love teenagers. Um, and uh, I'm available now for singing as well. <laughs> I may do a world tour of all the shrines uh, with, my, with my hymn. That's what I call hymns, volume one, as, as my sound <laughs> recording artist called it. But it's actually going to be called... Um, Grace will will lead you home because on the CD, um, my son, my two sons, my two nieces, myself and my mother sing the last song. I have a recording of her singing the last line uh, of Amazing Grace on her own. And it's Grace will lead you home. You know, she was always talking about going home and I know she's gone home. I didn't want to let her go, but she's gone home. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll add all that into the bio at the bottom. Good, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. God bless. Bye. Bye bye.